Thank you. Thank you, Mo. Very nice. It's always great to be in Reading. The, uh, what I'd like to talk about for a few minutes is coronary artery disease regression. Can it be achieved, and if so, how? Why? Well, you know, we've had this horrible pandemic, but still the number one killer over the last two years was coronary artery disease, cardiovascular disease. My disclosures are here. The only disclosure I'd really like to point out that um, this book, the author at the bottom, Live Younger Longer, uh, came out a few months ago. The, uh, there are some cards here we have that, you can, uh, that are referencing it, and a lot of what I say today will be from this book. What will we talk about? Well, appreciate the causes of coronary artery disease, plaque development, and progression. Review the message to measure it, to assess it, for plaque vulnerability, which means the plaque's likely to rupture, and then learn the factors that promote plaque regression. So to be clear, if you have coronary cardiovascular risk, that doesn't necessarily mean if you reduce it, you will reduce plaque regret, you will induce plaque regression. So plaque regression is part of decreasing cardiovascular risk. It's, and it's not just about the lipids. It's not just about the cholesterol as we talk about. Coronary artery plaque, what causes it, we'll talk about. What causes plaque re progression? How do you measure it? Well, it's imaging. There's different imaging techniques. Can we achieve regression? Well, yes, and you know, statins are always part of it, but lifestyle is very, very important. And why are we even talking about it? Because if you can achieve plaque regression, you can reduce coronary artery events. And plaque regression, you know, this is what patients now are starting to ask me about a lot. Doctor, how can I get my arteries to open them up? How can I get them to be new again? Well, I tell them, you know, it's kind of like your hair or your skin. You know, you're not going to make it like it was when you're 18 years old again, but you can certainly improve. So I'll ask a question. Coronary artery disease regression can occur in A, all coronary plaque, B, calcified plaque, C, fibrotic plaque, D, lipid-rich plaque, or E, regression cannot occur. Are we voting here? Are we, do we actually have any votes? <laughs> okay. Then the, I would say the lipid-rich plaque, because the calcified and the fibrotic plaque can't change. It's the scar. It's not going to change. It's like the cut you have on your hand since third grade. You're going to die with it, not because of it. But the, the lipid-rich plaque is what causes the problems, and it can actually uh, regress. So what are the mechanisms of plaque formation and progression? Well, all plaque really begins with endothelial dysfunction. You know, the endothelium lines the artery like wallpaper on the wall, and something that damages it allows this, this lipid to get inside of it. Now, why, you know, why is lipid there? Why is cholesterol there? And I th this is a big deal because patients now come to me and say, Doctor, I've read this book, The Cholesterol Myth. And, you know, cholesterol is not, it does not cause disease. And I'll say, well, you know, that, that's, that's an interesting point, that we all have cholesterol and we're mammals. You know, so every cell in our body has to have cholesterol. And we have the average human adult has about 37 trillion cells in their body that each need thousands of doses of cholesterol every day. So you can imagine 37 trillion times thousands. I don't even know if they have a name for a number that big. But the problem is that cholesterol is a fat. And so it floats in our water-based transport system called blood. So the body has to be able to figure out how to take the fat or the lipo, wrap it in a protein, and it's called a lipoprotein, so it doesn't float which would mess up our transport system. So that's where we get this term LDL. And I tell them this every day. In fact, YouTube came to Mayo recently and said, we need more trusted medical information on the YouTube. And they came and said, would you do, your, do some cholesterol things? So they're on the YouTube. So because they, apparently everybody's going to videos, as you know, these days. So what happens is we have all this cholesterol running around our body. And if you have damage of the lining of the artery, and we'll talk about what causes that, if you have damage to it, the cholesterol can go in underneath the endothelium and start to cause problems with the endothelium. It causes inflammation. Cholesterol is very inflammatory. In fact, every plaque that we have in our body has cholesterol in there that causes continued inflammation and irritation. 
So this is a schematic, and the thing to point out is that here you start out with an artery that's nice and, and normal over here on the left. You start to get some plaque buildup, and as you get plaque buildup, you get these vascular smooth muscle cells that proliferate around the plaque, and eventually in a shoulder region, which is kind of a, a region where there's more pressure, it will rupture. And when it ruptures, that's when you have a, acute coronary syndrome, heart attack, death, whatever that we're all aware of. So the, the issues here are, if you have this plaque, ruptured plaque, obviously the adventitia, the perivascular inflammation I talked about with the lipids that are there, you have a necrotic core. So it's a core of cholesterol that's it's in the middle. And it's the cholesterol part that actually can change. This fibrous cap covers it, and as we'll talk about, it's usually about 65 uh, microns. Remember, a micron is a millionth of a meter. It's a very small distance. We'll talk in a few moments about how to, how to visualize that. And then uh, you have high macrophage density. So macrophages don't like this necrotic core. They go and invade, and there's a lot of some smooth muscle cells, and you finally get a tear in the lining of the artery, and you get plaque hemorrhage, and you get thrombus. So the important things are this fibrous cap, because it's the fibrous cap the tears. So the mechanism of plaque rupture, the rupture occurs where the cap is thinnest and most infiltrated by these macrophages or white blood cells. Remember, our body doesn't like inflammation. Our body doesn't like to have things in it that it's not used to. And the more inflammation you have in your body, the more likely you are to have plaque rupture. It's very interesting, an article came out last week showing that people that have like periodontist, periodontal disease, you know, inflammation of their gums, their red blood, their, uh, their bone marrow actually senses that and puts out more white blood cells to find inflammation around the body to find it and get rid of it. And so if you have periodontal disease, you're more likely to have plaque rupture. Why? Because your bone marrow is putting out white cells that will go work on, instead of working on the periodontal disease, it'll work actually on the plaque uh, on the plaque in your coronary arteries. So this weak spot is where you have the plaque, uh, where you have the, uh, the rupture. And the plaque was found years ago, about a decade or so ago, to be only uh, 23 microns would be the average. And you, you start to have plaque rupture below 65 microns. So they've turned, uh, come up with this term, thin cap fibroatheroma. And this is something that I think it's really important to remember because it's, it's very thin, so how thin is it? Well, one of our founders, uh, Charles Mayo, said, I think a great quote that was very prescient, it is unfortunate that people do not understand from what small things diseases come. So what do I mean by that as it relates to plaque rupture? If you want to predict who's going to have plaque rupture, try to find vulnerable plaque. And it's been shown that there are th uh, three ranges of plaque thickness. The plaque that ruptures is less than 55 microns in all ruptured plaques. The ones that are stable, the fibroatheroma or the scarred or the, the thickened plaque, is 84 microns. So what's a micron? Well, remember, a red blood cell is about 8 microns. So we're talking the difference between stable plaque and ruptured plaque of about 4 red blood cells lined up. So it's a very small amount. So how, how, why is that? Why is it even important? Well, you know, at Mayo, on Super Bowl Monday, we have extra people in the emergency department. <laughs> and it's because Super Bowl Sunday is the single biggest pizza takeout day in the country. <laughs> pizza is a highly ultra-processed food we'll talk about in a few minutes. A lot of pro-inflammatory uh, foods can cause plaque rupture. Uh, it's been shown the milieu in your, in your uh, blood vessels the day after you eat or the few hours after you eat highly processed food uh, is pro-inflammatory. And so we actually have people there to help with the heart attacks and the heart failure that we get the next day. So the fibrous, uh, next day after the Super Bowl. So the, the best way to look at this is that if you have fibrous cap thickness less than 55 microns, that's who ruptures. If you have microphage infiltration, that's also a factor, and the necrotic core, that's also a factor. 
But interestingly, the percent stenosis is really not helpful to tell you who's going to rupture. So here's some pictures just to orient you that um, over on the left is the very mild stenosis. Over on the right is very severe stenosis. And you can see that here's a severe stenosis with a thrombus in it. But actually, what will, be, what will really happen is these necrotic cores, and these aren't very highly uh, stenotic lesions at all. The necrotic core, uh, can, if you have a, a thin cap, will rupture, and you get a thrombus that occurs there. It's actually the, the very scarred lesions that are very thick uh, caps don't actually rupture. So it's believed that you know through the years, in fact, when I was in school, that most uh, AMIs, acute MIs, actually occurred in uh, very mildly narrowed plaques. And that based on angiographic studies done months to years in advance. And I remember as a, uh, as, a, as a cardiology fellow, one of the articles came out uh, that showed that actually about a 30% lesion was just as likely to cause a, a heart attack as an 80% lesion. And the reason is, as I mentioned, is that if you look at some of the, many of the studies that were done, they were done more than three months prior to MI. And they found that uh, the average lesion was 36%. But when you look at studies that were done less than three months prior to MI, the lesion starts to progress. So the lipid buildup, whatever happens with the macrophages and the inflammation and the plaque builds up. And after the, uh, after the uh, STEMI, for instance, there's really no difference. So the decrease in luminal stenosis occurs about three months prior to plaque rupture. So again, anything that moves that quickly is likely due to this high lipid uh, concentration. So coronary artery disease regression, how do you measure it? How to achieve it? If you look at the way we've measured coronary artery disease over the years, it's been primarily an angiography-based definition. And so here, if you have a 40% lesion on the left, the 40% uh, lesion would be called, would be said it progresses if it goes up to 50%, and it would say it regresses if it goes down to 30%. But if you look at it with a plaque-based definition, as shown on the right here, you can see that the lesion on the top, it actually is uh, called um, progression, but actually uh, it's progression. I mean, it, it's progression because you can see the necrotic core gets worse. Here on the bottom, it's actually stabilization, and the, uh, the plaque cap gets thicker. So really, the definition on the right is a much more accurate way to measure plaque than the way we measure it usually on the left. So what techniques do we have? A lot of invasive techniques. The top is intravascular ultrasound. You can see this is from the Japan ACS trial. And the, actually, this shows from left to right plaque regression. So the artery actually opens up. Here with the, the next is the intravascular ultrasound, or IVUS. This also shows regression. You see the lumen, the dark space gets bigger. But also, there's a little less, uh, uh, less plaque that's occurring. Now, if you look at OCT, which is optical coherence tomography, this brownish picture, this can actually measure the fibrous cap. And you can see here, this is actually some thickening of the cap. So that's a good thing to happen. And then these are all invasive techniques, but, but CTA is, getting, is, uh, is emerging as a very good way to look at these lesions. And you can see here the plaque volume actually got better. The, uh, you can see the green, which is the lipid, actually reduced. So this is a good regression of plaque as measured by CT. The, uh, and CT has, has gotten so much better just in the last two years, the software and the hardware. We just recently got uh, the first photon CT in the world at Mayo in Rochester. And the photon CT has the ability for the photon that of the, rate of the uh, CT actually gives feedback to tell what it hit. Did it hit calcium? Did it hit lipid? Did it hit a scar? So they can actually measure these things much more accurately. So here are the modalities we have. And the only problem with IVUS and optical uh, or OCT is that they're invasive. The CT is not, and the PET CT, which is a combination to tell you both of the lesion and of uh, ischemia, is not invasive. So I think that the non-invasive way is certainly the best way to go. And if you look at the amount of uh, relationship between the achieved LDL and the change in print percent atheromas volume, 
uh, here is from the uh, Glygolf study. In Glygolf, they used uh, evolocumab or Repatha with a statin versus without, uh, without a statin without evolocumab. And you can see the LDL with statin alone was 93, the LDL with, with statin and evolocumab was 37. And so the plaque regression started to occur in about half the patients or half the lesions that could regress at about an LDL below 80. And it occurred in about uh, half, over half, and maybe 90% of the patients when it gets below 60. The, uh, this is, a, I think, an important point. And the recent guidelines for lipids use this actual data to uh, encourage uh, LDL less than 70. Now, you may be aware that the European guidelines are about three to five years ahead of us, and they have actually come out and said if you have recurrent uh, episodes of acute coronary syndrome or events with LDL uh, elevated over 70 or around 70, try to get your LDL around 40. And I think that's where we're going, because you can see if you can get it down to about 40, you do get much less likelihood of plaque progression. Now here I mentioned the OCT, the optical coherence tomography. And what's great about it, it can be combined with a CT in the same patient, not at the same time, but to look at lesions and can figure out this lipid arc. So the lipid arc means they can measure the lipid pool. It's the dark part on the left side of the slide. So the lipid shows up dark and they can assess how big of a lipid pool it is, the greater the lipid arc. So the wider the arc, the more lipid pool. And it can also measure the fibrous cap thickness. And so, again, this fibrous cap thickness, less than 65, is, uh, is the one that's more likely to rupture. And here you can see that um, the fibrous cap thickness, this was from a, a study that patients got statins and, or statins and evolocumab, that they had a much smaller fibrous uh, or, uh, lipid arc with the statins and the evolocumab. And the patients that got statins um, alone had, um, had just as much lipid there. Also, the fibrous cap thickness uh, reduced significantly more likely in the patients that got the more aggressive care. Uh, I said that backwards. I apologize. The people that got more aggressive care had thicker fibrous caps, which is what you want, obviously. The, uh, the Hugen study, the primary endpoint, it was a similar study, evolocumab with statins versus placebo. Here you can see the fibrous cap thickness got greater with the ones that were on the more aggressive lipid care. And if you look at also the lipid arc, it got less. Here's about a 60% reduction in the lipid arc with the ones that were aggressive. Now, you have to remember not all lesions are lipid rich. Some are scarred and uh, that are fibrotic, calcified, and we can't really see those uh, regress. And you don't really know what it is with an angiogram, with an invasive angiogram, which is our standard way of doing it. You really need to do, I think, more and more CT scans that, that help us uh, discern this. And if you look at in the uh, that last trial, in the Hugens trial, you can see that on the left side, the achieved LDL goes from 10 up to 110 on the right. And the achieved LDL, actually, the lower it gets, the greater the change in the uh, minimal fibrous cap thickness. So again, what we're seeing is that it does depend on lipids, but as I'm going to show you in a minute, it's much more than lipids. So what factors actually lead to plaque rupture and acute coronary syndrome? You know, one of my favorite questions to ask the fellows is, um, what's the mean LDL at the time of presentation to a hospital with urgent coronary artery disease symptoms? Is it 85, 105, 125, 145, or 165? And most of the fellows will say, you know, it's 145. Uh, some will say 165, some 125. But actually, the mean LDL from the, uh, from the Get With The Guidelines program from Ken Eagle published this over a decade ago, the mean LDL was 105 at the time of acute coronary syndrome. And I see a lot of patients uh, in prevention at, at uh, our institution and men, and I'll say, you know, your LDL's a little high. And they'll say, well, what do you mean? My LDL is, is 105. What do you mean it's high? I've been to this institution every year for the past 10 years. I've seen 10 doctors, and no one's ever told me it's too high. I said, I appreciate that. But uh, I bet they told you it was normal. 
They say, yeah, they tell me it's normal, so why are you saying it's high? I say, well, because in medicine we we sometimes confuse the concept of normal and average. (laughs) Now, while your LDL may be average, it's not normal. And uh, so the LDL, you know, if you have a heart attack, we want to get it down under 70. Unless you're in Europe, it's even lower, get it under 50. So if you look at the relationship, though, of LDL, it's not just about LDL. This is a very interesting study just came out from the Western Denmark Heart Registry. 23,000 patients, and they looked at the LDL, as you can see, less than 77 on the left, and over 190 on the right. And these are the same scales, and this is the event rate for, for acute coronary syndromes and cardiac events. And you can see this is a calcium score. And so the calcium scores um, differentiated the event rates, meaning the more calcium you had, the greater the event rates. And calcium score is probably just an index for having uh, you know, plaque that forms. But the point is, the event rates in the low LDLs, less than 77, and the high LDLs, over 190, really aren't, better, aren't any different. In fact, the LDL less than 77 may actually be higher event rates. So either this tells us this LDL doesn't matter, which I don't think is true, or it tells us that an LDL of 77 is still too high, which I think is true. So we have a lot of lipoproteins. We have a lot of lipids in our plaques. And as I had said earlier, it binds to the, uh, you know, the lipids will bind in, in going through the endothelium. They'll cause uh, you know, recurring inflammation. And the point is that a couple of studies referenced here have shown that the higher LDL levels are needed to induce disease than to sustain progression of disease. So what do I mean by that? Early in life, you know, if you're LDL, you need a little higher LDL to cause this problem, this plaque to build up. And as, the, as you go through life, once you have the plaque there, it takes a lower LDL to actually cause progression of the plaque and plaque rupture. Now, you know, I'm from, originally from Texas, as Dr. Kahn said, and when, um, you know, one of our great heroes in Texas was Lyndon Baines Johnson, who passed the Medicare Act in 1965, they basically said, we're going to wait until you're 65 years old and then spend a ton of money on you, pre- treating your disease. And every insurance company since then has followed that. They don't pay for prevention. I can guarantee you that. I know that. The, uh, but what they do do is um, they, they wait until you have disease, and they spend a lot of money treating you. Unfortunately, we, we don't really treat with lipids. You know, if you have a 40-year-old patient who has an LDL of 170, you say, oh, gosh, let's you know, try your diet, work on a lifestyle, come back in three to five years. They come back in three to five years, and they haven't changed. So the point here is that we need to start treating earlier. Uh, and when I say treating, I don't mean with medicines. I mean, there's a lot of things that people can do to lower their, lower their lipids and uh, make their life healthier earlier. And one of the things centers around inflammation. So if you look here, this is CRP. And on the left-hand side, this is the risk ratio of having a coronary disease. And you can see as CRP goes up, the risk of coronary disease goes up. And on the right-hand side, it's comparing the, the risk of, of CAD from CRP, meaning inflammation, it's an index for inflammation, compared to SBP, which is systolic blood pressure, TC is total cholesterol, and non-HDL cholesterol is probably a very good indicator also. But you can see that the inflammation is probably just as bad, if not worse, to cause CAD progression. So what factors lead to all this? Well, we talked about some of the factors with an individual plaque, like the cap thickness, less than 65 or 55 microns, is more likely to rupture. You have macrophage infiltration, which we cannot measure, uh, and necrotic core, which we can measure with a CT. And then lipids, inflammation, and the causes of inflammation, and then which is primarily lifestyle. So what factors promote CAD plaque regression? Well, they've tried to answer this, and they've done studies. Actually, one study came out over a decade ago called the reversal study. In the reversal study, there was no reversal. It was very interesting. They actually gave 40 of pravastatin versus 80 of atorvastatin, and you can see both of the LDLs were somewhat high. At the time, though, they were felt to be adequate treatment. And they did IVUS and found that there was really no plaque reversal of significance there was a little better with the higher dose atorvastatin than the lower dose pravastatin. 
but there really was no significant uh, regression. And if you put together different studies, a correlation between plaque regression and progression and achieved LDL, here the x-axis is the LDL going from 40 up to 100. The y-axis, the uh, dotted red line, is a 0% change in atheromatous volume by uh, usually ultrasound, but there are different techniques. And you can see there's a little bit of a, of a relationship. The higher the LDL, maybe the, uh, the less atheromatous volume regression. The GLAGOF in the Odyssey studies, the blue dots on the left are the, are the PCSK9 inhibitor studies, which are the most potent drugs we have. But you can see many of these studies actually work quite well. So it's, it indicates that it's not just about the LDL. There's other things going on. And if you look at the key factors for heart disease now, diet is the number one cause of early death and early disease in this country, in this world. There are other issues. Obviously, I'm a, a simple cardiologist, so I have to put it in simple terms, like north, south, east, west. <laughs> and uh, nutrition, exercise, the sleep. You just heard a great uh, talk on sleep. Stress. Who is not stressed in the last two years? Anybody? <laughs> no hands, Dr. Khan. Except everybody, all of your employees raised their hand. They said they were. Uh, smoking, spirits, and weight. So obviously there are a lot of other factors that lead to disease. So diet. How do we assess diet? Well, there's the USDA has come out and said the optimal diet has five components. Eating fruits and vegetables, fish a couple of times a week, fiber, Sodium should be low, and then sugar drinks should be less than 450 calories a week. If we look at adults, about 1 in 300 adults are doing that now, and about 1 in 1,000 of our adolescents are doing that. And adolescents are primarily the sugar-sweetened beverages. So if you're, if you're uh, say you're seeing a 46-year-old woman for CAD risk reduction, her current diet could be improved, she asks you, What's the optimal amount of carbs in her diet to reduce mortality? So what, you, what do you tell her? Do patients ever ask you that? In so many ways they ask it, you know, because the keto diet's a big deal now. It has been since it came out in 1868 in London. <laughs> Is it 10 to 20%, 20 to 30%, 30 to 40, 40 to 50, or 50 to 60%? And the answer is 50 to 60% is the ideal amount of carbs to eat. If you talk to a keto person about eating more than about 20% carbs, they start to get real shaky and jittery. But if you look at a couple of studies, one in the ARC, the atherosclerosis risk in the communities, and one was the PURE study, which was a multinational uh, study of every continent uh, that, that was populated in the world, thousands of patients. And the x-axis is the carbohydrate intake, and the y-axis is all-cause mortality. And you can see that the ideal amount of carbs is about 50 to 60 percent, but the key is these have to be unprocessed carbs, and that's a big deal. So the Mediterranean diet that we promote at Mayo, it's our most common thing we give out to patients, is um, encourages nuts and olive oil. That's the two main components. The main source of fat should be extra virgin olive oil. The, uh, some fruits, vegetables, a little bit of seafood, white meat, poultry, alcohol, uh, small amounts, and then underneath this red dotted line, colas should be very small amount. It doesn't matter if it's dairy, if it's um, if it's diet or not, because co colas have phosphorus, and the phosphates damage your endothelium. The dairy should be small amounts. Processed foods and sweets three times a week. So if you go to a hamburger store and get a hamburger, fries, that's three servings: the bun, the burger, and the fries. And then red meat, uh, one, a, one a day, of uh, three ounces of red meat a day. So this diet has been shown to reduce not just cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's, cancers, erectile dysfunction, female sexual dysfunction. The only diets that really have been shown prospectively to reduce these things are the DASH diet, which is a Mediterranean on low salt, and the Mediterranean diet. Now... If you look at the Mediterranean, you know, you're discussing healthy nutrition with a 65-year-old man. He asks you, what's the benefit of the extra virgin olive oil or the nuts that's in the Mediterranean diet? Why are they better than corn oil, canola oil, soybean oil? Is it the high monounsaturated fat that's in them? Is it the anti-inflammatory potential? Is it the reduced LDL, the raised HDL, or the reduction in blood pressure? 
it's actually the anti-inflammatory properties. In fact, these multiple studies have shown that it's the anti-inflammatory uh, has a much more uh, a much more potent anti-inflammatory of extra virgin olive oil than if you process that olive oil. And the corn oil, the canola oil, the safflower oil, the sunflower oil is all highly processed and it has zero anti-inflammatory potential. Here you can see from the women's uh, heart or health study, they tried to assess how much of the reduction in events from the, from the Mediterranean diet was due to inflammation. It looks like about 30%. So there's other things too, but uh, the in, in reducing inflammation is key. And again, that's what causes the plaque rupture, is the inflammation. Now I mentioned earlier ultra-processed foods. At the beginning, this is data from the before COVID, where if you look at the intake of, uh, of calories in this country from ultra-processed foods, about 56% of it pre-COVID was from ultra-processed foods. There are four levels of processing. You know, you, everything's processed to some degree. You take a piece of chicken, you, you clean it with water, you put it in plastic, that's level one. Level four, the ultra-processed foods, meaning that they added calories to it, they added f fat to it, they added sugar to it, uh, and they um, or added chemicals for preservatives to it. When I think of ultra-processed foods, I think of Oreos for three reasons. One, Oreos or have tons of extra sugar added. Oreos have lots of extra fat added. Remember, one Oreo cookie is like 70 calories. And the third reason I think of them is because I love them. <laughs> I, love to eat, I love to eat Oreos. And, um, but this points out that, um, that everybody eats ultra-processed foods. Even the lowest quartile is 25% uh, of the calories come from ultra-processed foods. And as you can see, the younger you are, the more likely you are to eat ultra-processed foods. So now, uh, the data just came out that of our adolescents, age 12 to 19, 66% of their calories every day consumed in this country are from ultra-processed foods. If you poll a 20 to 35-year-old individual in this country and say, where do you like to buy your food? You know their number one answer? A vending machine. About 75% of that age group goes to a vending machine every day, and about 70% of all Americans actually go to a vending machine every day. And the, the, the millennials don't, they, they like not having a sales pressure. They like instant gratification. You put the money in, you push the button, and boom, there it is. That's that generation. The, um, uh, Dr. Playa mentioned this earlier. A study from one of my colleagues, uh, Varen Summers at Mayo, who's a sleep, cardio a sleep study cardiologist, pointed out that if he gave people more sleep on the right, on the x-axis, one hour, two hour, three hour more sleep, their change in energy intake went down. So they ate less calories by about 270 calories a day. And it didn't change their calorie expenditure. They, didn't, they weren't more active. They just ate less. And guess what? Other studies have shown when you get less sleep, you eat more ultra-processed food. But it's not just about that, it's also about stress. Stress is huge. You know, work-related stress, chronic caregiver stress, they all, there are multiple pathways, the adrenaline that occurs, etc. cetera. Uh, multiple pathways have been worked out that lead to increased coronary events. Uh, psychological stress, obviously, is a huge deal within the last two years. Uh, we were talking, I was talking to Dr. Wright earlier about we've had so many nurses in our institution that have left and, and quit, quit nursing. They've just said, I just can't take it anymore. And this is not at our institution, this is all around the country. Stress has gotten incredibly, incredibly difficult to deal with. But uh, back to the cholesterol issue. In the setting of elevated cholesterol, how helpful is lifestyle? Now, I treat a lot of familial hypercholesterolemia which is people with LDLs, you know, over 200 from genetic reasons. And my standard to tell them is that, you know, you really got to get your LDL down, but try to change your lifestyle. It's not going to change probably your, your cholesterol, but it, it's going to change your risk for heart disease. And this very interesting study that just came out shows that, uh, I think, incredibly well 
the risk of developing coronary disease in FH patients, which is familial hypercholesterolemia, they have a genetic you know, cause for their high cholesterol. And depending on their CAD risk depends on not just their LDL, but also their genes and their lifestyle. So to orient you, if you have a green, like under gene, you didn't have a, a genetic uh, finding. You didn't have a monogenetic cause of high cholesterol. If you had red, you did have positive genes. Under lifestyle, um, if it's green, you had a good lifestyle, as shown up above, the diet, exercise, smoke, uh, smoking, and, and uh, obesity. And if you were green, you took care of that. If you were red, you weren't so good with that. And you can see that if you, do, if you have both of them, bad lifestyle, bad genes, your risk is 66%. Good genes, good lifestyle, down to 10%. But look at this, uh, the third one from the left here, the one with the bad genes but good lifestyle. They can reduce their risk by 86% with lifestyle. So again, it's not only about the LDL. This isn't a fait accompli. And I know this because I see patients all the time. I saw a lady a couple weeks ago, 65 years old, had an LDL of about 220 on no meds. I said, gee, you know, is there much disease in your family? She says, well, there's, yeah, people have high cholesterol. You know, we've had that. And I said, how about your mom? So yeah, she had really high cholesterol and higher than mine. I said, what'd she die from? I said, die? She's not dead. She's 85 years old. She feels great. <laughs> she, I said, does she have any heart disease? No. So, you know, you can really change things with your lifestyle. That's very important. Now, what's happened in our country? Lifestyle has not been a priority. Losing weight is a priority. <laughs> That's one of the biggest selling books is weight loss books. So... Patients I'll see and say, doctor, but I'm trying to lose weight. I'm doing my best. And so I said, what are you doing? So I'm on a weight loss diet. I said, that's the problem. You should be on a healthy diet and let weight loss come rather than be on a weight loss diet because that's not going to be good. And if you look at the data, this is from the book, that the obesity rates and diet trends over the last, uh, over the last five decades, six decades, on the left, you can see the diets that came out, Atkins came out in the 70s. Our obesity rate was 13%, and now our obesity rate's up to 43%. By the end of this decade, it'll be 50% of adults are going to be obese. The, I actually like the, the uh, drinking man's diet. That, uh, <laughs> and you can see here, there's Slim Fast, an American Heart Diet, that uh, came out about the same time, and we haven't had much benefit. But I'm a big fan of Malcolm Gladwell, you know, he can read things and look at things and come away with very insightful observations. Well, he wrote an article, I'm sorry I didn't, it is referenced here, yeah, on the Pima paradox. The Pima Indians are the most obese ethnic group in the world. And he said he cracked the diet code book mantra in, in, uh, in 1998 when he wrote this article. And he observed that all the articles, or all the diets, reduced diet to a matter of technique, that the right foods eaten in the right combination can succeed where more rash traditional approaches failed. And he said very interesting, and I quote, they all seem to be making things up in precisely the same way. Now what did he mean by that? He said there are three parts to every diet that he's read. First is the darkness. Oh, I'm in the dark. I don't know what to do. I'm eating the wrong foods. I can't lose weight. The next is the eureka moment. I found the one secret that no one else in the world's discovered. Only I know it, but I can let you know it too, and you can lose weight. And you know what? That comes to the patent claim that you can, it's a myth that you have to suffer. You don't have to suffer. I know everybody says that, but of course you don't believe them. I was once just like you, convinced I had to suffer to lose weight because it's true, unless you use my diet. <laughs> this is a huge business. A hundred and eight million, that's the number of people on diets right now in the U.S., of which 85% are women. There's a real business here. There's this book called How Celebrities Make Money, and it's referenced here. <laughs> 500,000 to 3 million is the salary a celebrity is paid to endorse a weight loss program. So it comes out to about $33,000 per pound lost. Would anybody like to, if I offer you 33,000, would you work on losing a pound maybe? The whole 30, that was the 30 day guide to total health and food freedom. That was the all time biggest selling diet book. 
If I wrote a book that said, Dr. Khan, how to learn invasive cardiology in 30 days, do you think that that's possible? <laughs> if I said, how to raise the perfect child in 30 days, do you think that's possible? If I said, how to have the perfect marriage in 30 days, it's all a bunch of bull. And so are these things. The one hour per day is the time exercising for those who lost and kept off more than 30 pounds for five years. But remember, 100% of diets work if you follow them. Now, what happens is overweight and obesity is a big deal. We have a lot of weight cycling. It's called weight yo-yoing. People lose 5% of their weight. They gain back that weight. And if you look at this, uh, this study, which I think is fantastic, they looked at weight cycling. And on the left-hand side, you can see about 8% of adults in America, this is from NHANES data, are stable weight. 5% have lost it and kept it off. 53% just, just gain it. And then another third of us cycle. So if you look at the cycler, and the cycle is, you know, you lose the 5%, you gain it back. This is women on the top and men on the bottom. You can look at some of these parameters and how weight gainers and weight cyclers are really about the same. So total cholesterol, HDL, LDL, triglycerides all go the wrong way. Blood pressure, HOMA, which is an index of uh, insulin sensitivity, goes the wrong way. Blood pressures go the wrong way. So cycling is bad until you look at things like mortality. And weight cycling increases mortality 45% compared to those that stay stable weight. So getting back to regression, there are three key components. You look at, I think there have been three great studies on weight on, uh, on coronary disease regression. One was Dean Ornish's study. One was the, uh, the Glagoff trial, which was the uh, evolocumab, because they've all taught us different things. And one was the DISCO study, I'll tell you about in a moment. But they've all done three things, really. They've all Take care of the obvious. Treat the cholesterol, the lipids, the smoking, diabetes. They've all helped patients with diet and exercise, and they've all really helped patients manage stress. They had options in there to help patients manage stress. And you can look at the lifestyle heart trial. It was an angiography trial. They only lowered, uh, they had 2.2% regression, which was significant. Glagoff had 1.1% regression. And the DISCO study, had a 1% progression. But let's look at how they measured those things. They actually uh, looked at them um, uh, with different techniques. And the CAD regression in the Lifestyle Heart Trial was an angiogram, and they had a 2.2% lesion regression in a couple hundred, about a, a, a hundred patients. The CTA, the DISCO study, however, gave patients a DASH diet and physical activity versus a control. And you can see just about everybody was on statins. And they followed them up uh, 67 weeks later. But this was a CT scan study. They didn't do angiography. They didn't look at the lumen. They actually looked at the lesion. And they divided lesions up by Hounsfield units. And the higher Hounsfield units uh, is dense calcium or plaque that's fibrous. The lower uh, Lower Hounsfield units, less than 150, was fibrofatty or necrotic core. Now, this is somewhat crude, but it's, a, it's as good a way of any when they did the study a few years ago. And they looked at the plaque and saw regression. And they actually found that if you're on the statin alone, that you had about a 20% regression in the non-calcified or vulnerable plaque. That's what you want to have regressed. In fact, that's the only plaque that can regress is the, is the lipid-rich plaque, the scarred, Calcified won't. But if you were on uh, in the DASH diet as compared to without DASH diet in the control group, you had a 51% regression, which is really incredible. It wasn't big enough for, for data for outcomes, but it was important in terms of plaque regression. Here's a slide to finish up of one of my colleagues that we did a CT scan on him of his left main. Uh, on the left in March of 2020, you can see he had a lesion there with, um, with um, I've tried to blow up in the middle, see the calcified plaque, uh, and then the area around it that's lucent uh, that was the uh, lipid-rich plaque. Then 18 months later, last November, repeat CT scan, it's all calcium now, very little lipid. 
and we lowered his, uh, lowered his LDL significantly and got him to work on his lifestyle, uh, stress reduction, uh, other issues with, uh, with, re with the reduction in uh, improving lifestyle, his diet, etc. So you can see this can be done. I think this is what we're going to be doing in the next few years, is more and more scans like this, more and more ways of showing patients they're improving their lifestyle, improving their lipids, improving their plaque, and reducing their event rates. So to summarize, thin plaque caps, less than 55 millimeters are the ones that tend to rupture. Remember, when you get a thick, over 85 microns, they don't rupture, and that's maybe four red blood cells thicker. So it's tiny, tiny little things. Plaque regression lessens the risk of plaque rupture. The level of LDL to cause plaque is less than commonly believed. Remember I talked earlier that it's probably much, much, much lower than we thought. And the plaque regression is multifactorial, diet, stress, sleep, lipids. And CTA, I think, is evolving to be a good way to assess this. Not that everybody's going to need a CTA, but it'll help us, I think, uh, learn more about how to do this. So thank you for your attention. Here's the reference for that book I mentioned on the right. Thank you, Dr. Kahn, for having me.